Hi everyone, my name is Chad Jeffords. I'm the programs coordinator at Bentonville Battlefield. And today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the Battle of Bentonville, which was the largest battle ever fought uh, on North Carolina soil. It happened March 19th through 21st of 1865. But really to understand how the armies got here, we need to back up a little bit. Uh, so for that, let's back up uh, to the latter part of 1864. And we'll check in with the Union forces first here. Um, late 1864, uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman, he's concluding that 285 mile march to the sea uh, where he went from Atlanta to Savannah, uh, living off the land the whole way. Uh, he arrives just before Christmas time. So he's gonna actually offer the city uh, of Savannah to President Lincoln as a Christmas present. Uh, once he has Savannah, uh, Grant is U.S. Grant, the commander up in Virginia at this point. Uh, he's going to instruct Sherman to move his army group uh, via ship. Uh, so actually go up the coast uh, to Richmond to help him destroy Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, now Sherman and Grant have a close relationship. They're, they're very friendly with each other. Uh, and so Sherman's going to kind of talk to Grant about this. Uh, he would much rather move his army over land uh, rather than have them board ships. Uh, it's going to take actually longer at this point because of the lack of vessels available. Uh, so it's going to take longer for him to move his army via ship than if he just um, walks it, basically. Uh, so he's going to convince him of that. Sherman also uh, doesn't want to move his army via ship because everybody's in really good spirits and really good health. Uh, and so for that reason, he wants to kind of follow up that march to the sea with another uh, march over land. So he's going to be allowed to do that. Uh, and of course, the other element of that is he's going to be able to do in South Carolina uh, what he had just done in Georgia, uh, destroying a lot of uh, key war material. Uh, for the Confederate war effort. Uh, so that's what's going on with the Union troops at this point. Now let's shift over and see how things are going on the other side with the Confederates. Uh, and we're backing up a little bit uh, further than winter of 1864. It's actually during the summer during the Atlanta campaign uh, when General Joseph Johnston, uh, who at the time was commanding the Army of Tennessee, which is the principal uh, Confederate Army in the Western Theater. Uh, he's going to be replaced. Uh, he's not aggressive enough for um, the Confederate uh, high command, uh, especially President Davis. There's a little bit of a rub between those two. Uh, so he's going to be replaced by John Bell Hood. Uh, John Bell Hood is a very aggressive commander. Uh, he's going to uh, essentially shatter this army uh, at the tail end of 1864 in the Nashville campaign. Uh, Franklin and Nashville, the key engagements there. Uh, but during the last six months uh, of 1864, essentially that army is going to be reduced uh, in its effective fighting force uh, by over half. Um, just a lot of aggression, uh, frontal assaults on entrenched Union troops that uh, didn't turn out too well uh, for those guys. Uh, so after, after the Nashville campaign ends, uh, the Army of Tennessee will retreat. Uh, they'll go towards Tupelo, Mississippi, and that's where they're going to spend the winter. And of course, they're just kind of a shell of what they used to be. Uh, so after the Nashville campaign, uh, PGT Beauregard is going to replace John Bell Hood, and he's going to be in command for just a couple months, uh, up until Robert E. Lee is given the title General-in-Chief of all Con Confederate forces. At that point, uh, Lee is going to recognize that he needs somebody to stop Sherman and that Beauregard is not the man to do it. Uh, he wants Joseph E. Johnston back in command uh, of those forces uh, in that area. So he's going to recall him from retirement. Um, Johnston will take over on February 22nd of 1865. Uh, and he's going to essentially have the task of scraping together every available uh, Confederate force uh, to try to do something to stop Sherman at this point. Now, Johnston kind of thought he was being made a scapegoat. He thought the politicians were putting him in charge because they wanted, they didn't like him. Like we mentioned, there's a little bit of a rub there. And 
they thought they wanted him to be the one that had to surrender kind of as an insult to him. Uh, but when he found out that Robert E. Lee was the one who requested him, uh, he's going to kind of have a change of heart uh, and be a little bit more enthusiastic about it, shall we say. Uh, so that's how the Confederates are. Uh, as we move through the winter of 1865, Johnston is just trying to find forces wherever he can and try to concentrate them somewhere to stop Sherman's army. Uh, what's Sherman's army up to? Well, uh, in February of 1865, he's going to start his march north from Savannah. He had originally intended to move uh, before then, but heavy rains uh, throughout January are going to prevent him from stepping off until February, uh, February 1st of 1865. Now, as you can see on the map here, uh, my cursor will show up, uh, you've got the left wing is going to start in a movement towards Augusta. The right wing is going to start in a movement towards Charleston. Now, ultimately, his objective is here at Columbia. Uh, however, Sherman's going to move his army in two columns or wings uh, to prevent Confederate forces from concentrating in front of him. So he will arrive in Columbia on February 17th. That same day, Charleston will be evacuated, and you can see General Hardee with the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. He's going to start moving northward again, heading up to some concentration point where he can join up with Johnston's forces and again, try to concentrate in front of Sherman. Um, but so that's Sherman moving through South Carolina. Now they're dealing with some swampy terrain, uh, but it's really a, a engineering marvel for these guys that they're able to make the kind of pace that they do uh, covering that whole state essentially in a, in a month. As Sherman moves northward, he comes into North Carolina in the first week of March. They are going to reach Fayetteville by March 11th after a brief cavalry engagement, uh, March 10th at Monroe's Crossroads, which is on present day Fort Bragg. But once they move into Fayetteville, Sherman's main objective is destroying the arsenal at Fayetteville. He's Remember, he's destroying all the material key to the Southern War effort. So that arsenal is going to be one of his key targets along the way. Now, once he is going to leave Fayetteville, Sherman knows very well that he's headed to Goldsboro. Goldsboro is a major rail hub. He's also got, if I back up, uh, if you look, you've got Schofield coming in from the coast. Uh, they're headed to Goldsboro. He's got 30,000 more troops that are gonna meet with him at Goldsboro, taking his army from essentially 60,000 to basically 90,000. Uh, so he's looking for that. He's also seeing these rails coming in from both of North Carolina's ports, which are already going to be in uh, Union hands, really Fort Fisher, this map says February 17th, but really Fort Fisher had fallen well before that. Uh, so as they, as they move, he knows he's got some help, uh, kind of a security blanket, if you will, with Union forces here along the North Carolina coast. Uh, but he is looking for that uh, junction there with Schofield's men at Goldsboro. So uh, he's heading to Goldsboro, but he's going to send his left wing northward from Fayetteville on the Raleigh-Fayetteville stage road as if they're going to Raleigh, again, to prevent uh, the Confederates from concentrating in front of them. But as they move north, they're going to meet with really their first resistance uh, in force here uh, in North Carolina. And it's going to happen at the tiny town of Aversboro, just south of it. It's some very carefully selected land here. You can see General Hardy has made it up here. He has his Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida on the field. And they're going to be in three lines, basically, uh, arrayed from south to north. Because again, Sherman's moving to the north along that road. So he's going to have three defensive lines. And what that does here, this land is a natural choke point. You see you've got the Cape Fear River on the right flank of the Confederates. The Black River is over here on the left flank. So even though there's 30,000 men facing this Confederate army, uh, they're not really going to be able to be flanked. So they can kind of hold their ground and delay Sherman's army. Uh, and they are going to be successful in doing so for about 36 hours before they are going to 
retreat northward towards Smithfield. Another important battle to mention here as we build up to Bentonville is the Battle of Wise's Forks. This is going to happen right around Kinston, North Carolina. It actually happens March 7th through 10th, so before the Battle of Aversboro. Uh, but General Braxton Bragg is going to take his Department of North Carolina and try to stop Schofield as he starts to move west. Again, he's heading to Goldsboro to meet up with Sherman. Uh, Bragg is not going to be successful in this effort. And really to make matters worse, he's using rail cars to transport his forces back and, back and forth between Smithfield, which is their concentration point right for now, uh, and Kinston. So a lot of that rolling stock, as they called it, the rail cars are gonna be preoccupied and you're not going to have them, if you're Johnston, you don't have them for moving the rest of the Army of Tennessee as it comes into the state. Uh, so logistically, they are very, very much uh, having, having some problems here. But Johnston is very well aware here uh, that time's running out. If he's going to prevent J Sherman from linking with Schofield, if they do that, they can easily turn up to go defeat Lee's army. If they're allowed to get to Goldsboro, that supply train, uh, the only real way of supplying Lee's army is going to be cut. Uh, and so Johnston knows the time is now to attack. Uh, his cavalry commander, Wade Hampton, has scouted uh, a little area south of the village of Bentonville, uh, right around, it's gonna be called the Coles Plantation. We'll see that in a minute. But Johnston is going to take the advice of Wade Hampton and go ahead and move his army to Bentonville. So on March 18th, Hampton had already scouted the area, and by the end of the day, Johnston is going to have his army headed from Smithfield to the little hamlet of Bentonville. And what Johnston is hoping to do here is deal a decisive blow to one of Sherman's columns before the other one can turn around uh, and come to its aid. So he knows it's a numbers game. He does not want to face all of Sherman's army at once. So he feels that if he can deal one blow to the left wing before the right wing can turn around, maybe he's got a shot here. It's still a Hail Mary play, but they are gonna try to run it here. So what, what scraps of an army is Johnson able to bring together here? Well, we've got uh, the Department of North Carolina. Uh, it's gonna be right around 500 or 5,557 effective troops at this point. They're led by General Braxton Bragg. Uh, the main component of that force is going to be Robert F. Hope's division from the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, you also have the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. That's going to be just under 6,000. That's led by Lieutenant General William Hardy. The Army of Tennessee contingent, that's down to about 4,500. Uh, now, before Franklin, that's, that's up around 30,000 men. So that shows you just how rough of a winter those guys had had. Uh, but that's led by Lieutenant General Alexander P. Stewart, who had been a Corps commander in the Army of Tennessee before. And then you have Wade Hampton's cavalry, led by Lieutenant General Wade Hampton, and that's another 4,000 men. Uh, so this is, this is Johnston's army uh, at Bentonville. There's not going to be a lot of cohesion. These guys are not very used to fighting together, uh, but that's the dilemma that Johnston is facing, really, at this point, is just getting as much manpower together as possible. Compare that to Sherman's army group here. I am call it an army group because it is technically two different armies. The left wing is the Army of Georgia. Uh, it's going to be commanded by Henry Slocum. The left wing is made up of the 14th Corps and the 20th Corps. Both have well over 13,000 men. 14th Corps is going to be commanded by Jefferson Davis. No, not that Jefferson Davis, a different Jefferson Davis, Jefferson C. Davis. Uh, and then the 20th Corps is commanded by 54-year-old Alpheus Williams. His nickname is Old Pap. He has a very interesting mustache, shall we say. But uh, both of these guys are very experienced veterans at this point. The right wing, uh, the other army, the Army of the Tennessee, not to be confused with the Army of Tennessee. The Army of the Tennessee uh, is Sherman's right wing. It's commanded by Oliver Otis Howard. Uh, John Logan is the commander of the 15th Corps, and the other corps, the 17th Corps, is commanded by Francis Blair. Um, 
So this army has been fighting together for a while. They kind of understand what each other is going to do. Uh, and so that's going to be a big advantage for Sherman, not only in numbers, but also in uh, some degree of cohesion between his commanders. So March 19th, uh, we move into Bentonville now. The battle is going to start on March 19th, the really before dawn, uh, and even all day on the 18th. Um, the foraging parties, which are kind of the, they're going to gather the food up to, to feed the, the U.S. Army here. Uh, they're going to report very determined resistance from Confederate cavalry, more than just the normal harassment. Uh, it's going to be, they're not really moving as, as quickly as they usually do. They're not running away as fast uh, because that's kind of the MO for Confederate cavalry at this point, just to uh, stand, fire a couple shots long enough to force the, arm, the infantry to deploy and then take off. Uh, and just make slow them down that way. Uh, but like they said, like we said, the Confederate cavalry is not leaving as early. Um, well, the reason for that here, the Confederate cavalry has been given the task of screening the deployment of the Confederate forces. So they're trying to slow down that left wing as it moves up the Goldsboro Road here. Um, and so by the time they give way, you can see the Confederate formation here. Uh, it's going to look like a sickle or a question mark uh, with the handle here blocking the Goldsboro Road. That's Bragg's guys, Hoax Division. Uh, and then the Army of Tennessee is going to be the blade, which will swing down on the road at the appropriate time. But they're going to be concealed in the woods to the north of the road for the time being. So as the foraging parties are going forward, they're reporting back that there's more than just cavalry in front of us, but U.S. High Command has no, no idea that there's anything in front of them more than just a little bit of cavalry. Uh, in fact, 14th Corps Commander Davis is going to uh, tell Sherman that uh, I'm worried that there's more than just a, just a cavalry force in front. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, but Sherman basically tells him, no, it's just cavalry. Move them out of the way, and I'll see you uh, right outside Goldsboro tomorrow morning. Um, so as the day progresses, 1st Division, 14th Corps, in the lead of this left wing, uh, their commander, William P. Carlin, the picture pictured here, he's going to be getting impatient. Uh, as, as, they, as the foraging parties continue to report, that there's more than just cavalry in the way. He says, now y'all get out of the way. I'll move them aside with only a skirmish line. And like we said, they're, they're at the front of the left wing. They're trying to get be the first ones into Goldsboro. Uh, actually, General Carlin himself is wearing his finest uniform. He says in his uh, memoirs that it's because he wanted his troops to see him. He expected a battle. He wanted his troops to see him, but uh, a seasoned commander like him would know that that would make you a target, very easy target. So uh, I think he was probably looking more to look, look sharp as he moved into Goldsboro. Um, but at any rate, by 10 a.m., uh, they're going to be able to push back that Southern Cavalry force. Uh, and they're going to realize, they're going to begin to realize that there's a little bit more there. Um, but they're still unaware that there's a large body of Confederate troops in front of them. So as they begin, uh, as they get to the coal plantation we mentioned earlier, uh, kind of the central point for the Confederate um, deployment here, the men of Carlin's division are going to begin taking fire from Hoke's division. So you can see the junior reserves here. You can also see Atkins battery here. They're gonna start firing on those guys. Uh, so they're gonna move right here into this ravine. And it's still a very pronounced ravine today. We have a walking trail that goes right along it. You can see it. Um, but as, as Hoke's division shifts into that ravine, there's going to be a gap open up with the other troops that are on the field making contact with the men south of the road here. Uh, so that gap is going to pretty much stay there all day. Um, but by noon, um, General Carlin is going to order what's called a reconnaissance in force. He's basically going to feel for the Confederate right flank. He knows that there's artillery in this sector, but he doesn't know about this infantry yet. 
So you can see they're going to start to move this way, trying to feel their way around the Confederate right. Um, what happens instead is they're going to come across the Army of Tennessee uh, as they are digging in, uh, having arrived in position earlier that morning. Uh, and so that's going to be all 4,500 men uh, right there. At this point, and it's important to keep in mind, uh, we talk about the numerical advantage that Sherman's army had. Well, uh, at this point, the Confederates have around 10,000, 10 to 15,000 on the field, uh, whereas the Union army has about 2,000. So at the outset of this battle, the Confederates do have a numerical advantage, something they're not very accustomed to at this point. Um, but so the attack will uh, push up across the field and actually get pretty close to the Confederate line. Um, they will uh, almost get into the, um, to the point where they can break the Confederate line. Uh, they, they say they came, they came within about five rods. If you see that quote there, a regiment charged within about five rods of the enemy when our major was killed and our color bearer wounded. Um, five rods, I know that's not a very standard measurement for us today. It's going to be about 82 feet. Uh, so they're, they're right on top of each other, uh, essentially, before the Confederates open fire. They're going to start um, feeling the effect of that, Carlin's men are. Uh, and as each of these individual regiments has more and more casualties, they're going to start to feel uh, the need to retreat. And so they do. Um, but it does serve a very good purpose of finding out that there is more than just cavalry in front of them. They're finally able to confirm that. Uh, and they also have, uh, after the attack has been repelled by the Confederates, uh, three galvanized Yankees are going to jump from the Confederate line. A galvanized Yankee is a Union soldier who had been captured by the Confederates. And rather than go to a prison camp, they're given the option that you can just join up and fight with us. And so they do that as opposed to going to a prison camp, which could have ended up being a healthy decision, I suppose. But uh, at this point, they do jump from the Confederate line, run to the U.S. line, uh, and explain to uh, the U.S. commanders what's happening. Uh, and really, they're not taken seriously until they're taken to the wing commander, Henry Slocum who recognizes one of them as being from the same hometown that Slocum is from. And so he takes his word for it when he says, oh, I know this guy, he, I've seen you before. Uh, so at that point, Slocum's tone is going to change. Before then, uh, his, his correspondences with Sherman were all, yeah, it's just cavalry, all that you're hearing, don't worry about it, I can handle it. Uh, but around 1.30, the call for reinforcements is going to come. Uh, and so the rest of the 20th Corps is going to be hurried to the front, the other element of that left wing. Uh, but word is going to reach Sherman um, that Slocum has, in fact, struck Johnston's whole army. In response to the probing attack, uh, the Confederates realize that it's going to be important to go ahead and try to take the initiative. Uh, you see the quote there from Lieutenant General Wade Hampton. I think whatever we do should be done quickly. An advance of the line would break them. Uh, he's going to tell that to Joseph E. Johnston. So around 245, this is when the attack is finally going to launch. Now, it had originally been scheduled for 2 o'clock, um, but William Bate here is going to do some reconnaissance and realize that he was not going to overlap the Union left with his right, uh, which is not good when we're talking about linear tactics. So he's going to move William Tolliver into position with Rhett and Elliott's brigades. Uh, and so they'll extend that Confederate right. It does delay them about 45 minutes uh, to do so. But when they do attack, it's going to be completely successful. The, the troops that had probed for the Confederate lines had gone back and dug in on the near side of the ravine to the Confederate line, meaning they have to cross that ravine as they retreat, which is fine as they go downhill, but then they have to scramble back up the hill, uh, which becomes a challenge uh, as you're under fire, you present a nice target. 
And so they are going to be flushed through the ravine and pushed on back in pretty much complete disorder. You do see Robinson's 20th Corps Brigade, or part of it. He's only got three of his five, five regiments with him. He's only permitted to take that uh, to the front. He's going to be trying to cover this gap here in the Union, Union deployment, but with only three of his regiments, he's not going to be able to. And so um, the last grand charge of the Army of Tennessee is going to be a tremendous success. Um, one eyewitness, uh, Charles, Colonel Charles Broadfoot, he's in the 1st North Carolina's Junior Reserves. So he's going to be in this area. He's going to be able to see these guys moving across the field. He says, it looked like a picture and at our distance was truly beautiful. It was gallantly done, but it was painful to see how close their battle flags were together, regiments being scarcely larger than companies should be, and the division not much larger than a regiment should be. Again, that army had been shattered. Uh, in the at the end of 1864, so there's not nearly as many men uh, as there had been. Uh, but as they reach, as as they press on through that ravine that has been vacated by the by the Union troops, they're going to get to the edge of this field here. You can see where my cursor is, uh, and they're going to see the guns of Webb's battery, and they're also going to see Robinson's line here, and they're going to hesitate. Because again, they remembered Franklin. They remember what it looks like when they charge artillery pieces and entrenched infantry. It doesn't turn out well for them. Uh, but General Hardy will ride out in front of his guys and rally them. Uh, and they will go ahead and press on across this field. They'll capture three of Webb's four guns uh, on, on that field next to the coal plantation house. And Robinson's men will be forced to retreat. Uh, several hundred yards. Um, three of these four guns were captured. One is going to be evacuated by a 17-year-old private uh, named Peter T. Anderson in the 31st Wisconsin. He's just going to go jump on the team of horses that's attached to the gun, and he's going to be able to evacuate it. Uh, he does receive the Medal of Honor for, for that action, uh, as well as a captain's commission and the personal thanks of General Sherman. So not bad for a 17-year-old private. Um, but everything else uh, for, for the Union here is going to go pretty much wrong. Uh, and so as they are pushed back, we can see now we've got Morgan's men here south of the Goldsboro Road. Uh, they're entrenched, but they're also going to be very vulnerable uh, to a flank attack as the, can, as the Union left is swept away. Uh, and so now, uh, we do see as we move forward here, Morgan does have to, uh, he does have his hands full for a little while this afternoon, uh, March 19th. Bragg was supposed to attack as the Army of Tennessee launched their assault, uh, but he does not. He doesn't give a reason for this. Uh, he doesn't really even leave an after action report, uh, but he delays until 4 p.m. And what that does for the second division of the 14th Corps under James D. Morgan, again, these are experienced veterans. They had time, they were gonna start digging. Now it's very swampy in this area. So anytime they dug down, it would fill up with water. So they're essentially uh, more piling things up in front of them and packing it with mud than anything, but they're gonna be able to put out a pretty good fortification uh, in that time that they're allowed to, uh, well, while Bragg doesn't attack. And so we'll be able to see where that will come into play. Um, again, visibility in this area is very swampy. Uh, so it's dense woods, uh, swampy area. Um, these guys really couldn't see each other until they were just, fear, just feet from each other. Uh, and so couple that with the burning uh, of some of the vegetation in the area, and you really couldn't see anything down there. It was, it was very uh, tough, often hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Uh, there are gonna be three medals of honor earned in this portion of the battle, uh, pretty much all centering around capturing flags or preserving uh, flags. Um, but because they were afforded that time to dig in, they're able to repel the attack from Hoke's division when it does come at, four o'clock, like we said, but then they're going to have to uh, face 
Army of Tennessee troops coming in behind them. Uh, so how do they do that? Well, they're going to actually jump to the other side of their works uh, and fight off as best they can. But you've also got that call for reinforcements that Slocum made. And that's going to see Williams, William Cogswell's 20th Corps Brigade from Ward's division coming up. And so they are going to sweep in here, repel these Confederates back in um, preserve Morgan's security. And essentially, um, that's going to start to turn the tide uh, in the favor of the Union in this battle. Everything had been going the Confederates' way so far. Um, but now the 20th Corps starting to arrive. Every 30 minutes, there's another brigade for the Union arriving on the field. Uh, and so the numerical advantage that the Confederates experienced early in this battle is going to start to go away. So we move on now, we can see that the Union right has been stabilized to a degree. Cogswell has moved in there with Morgan's division uh, to kind of stabilize that. We also look over here at the left and we can see that the 20th Corps uh, has arrived in mass. Uh, and so that's going to really start to turn the tide as we said earlier, um, but, but the arrival of those troops, this you can see it a lot better on this map. Um, in the early evening hours, Confederates are going to attempt to break the center of the U.S. line here. Uh, you can see Bate is gonna, going to attack. Uh, you can also see Rhett and Elliott from Tolliver's, um, Tolliver's men. They're going to start making attacks. They're not really coordinated very well, uh, so they're not making the attacks all at the same time. So as Rhett and Elliott step off, they're going to be greeted by the 13th New Jersey and 82nd Illinois firing directly into their right flank. They're also, the first attack they make, they've got Stevens Battery to contend with firing a spherical case shot right into them. Uh, but as the, as the number of assaults go up, uh, it's gonna be between three and seven separate attacks that these guys are gonna make on the center uh, of the US line. So as that number goes up, so does the number of cannons uh, that the Union is going to stack up here. Uh, so the first attack, it's just Stevens' battery. Uh, but by the end of it, there's going to be 21 artillery pieces um, that the Union Army is going to use to blunt these attacks. Uh, and of course, with the reinforcement from the 20th Corps, uh, they're going to be able to kind of stem the tide here and, and essentially preserve uh, and save the day for that left wing. Uh, they're going to, the Confederates are going to continue fighting to well after dark. They're going to make a few different attacks uh, at different points in the line, but nothing's really put together well enough uh, to, to be much of a threat. Uh, so between 9 p.m. and midnight, the Confederates are going to withdraw to their original positions uh, like they had started the first day. Uh, and so that's a very brief overview of the first day of the battle. Um, which we could go on for a lot longer with that. Um, but we'll go ahead and move on now uh, as, as we progress to the 20th, uh, the second day of the battle. Um, Sherman is finally going to receive word uh, that Slocum's line is held, uh, but that's not going to be uh, until 2 a.m. Uh, he had received the message at 4.30 that Johnston's entire army was in front of him. Uh, so there were probably a few tense moments for, for General Sherman there. But his message to Slocum, you can see there, fortify your position and hold to the last, certain that all the army is coming to you as fast as possible. Uh, so the right wing is ordered to move on Bentonville at moonrise. You can see they're using roads almost parallel to the Goldsboro Road, uh, but to the south. And so they are going to, uh, in most cases, they're going to head up to the Goldsboro Road and then turn to the west. So they're going to be approaching Bentonville from the east. Uh, there will be some skirmishing with cavalry, uh, but they are going to start moving uh, very early. Some uh, as early as 1 a.m. Uh, are on the way to Slocum's assistance. So Johnston has a problem now. Um, the right wing is arriving. 
and that numerical disadvantage he didn't want to see, he's experiencing now. He's outnumbered three to one. Uh, but because uh, he's going to say he wants to get his wounded off the field, he's going to reform his lines in a U shape around the village of Bentonville. Um, so he did want to get his wounded off the field, but he did have another motive. Uh, he wants to lure Sherman into making a frontal assault on this new defensive line. Uh, you can see what he tells Robert E. Lee there. We held our ground in the hope that the enemy's greatly superior numbers might encourage him to attack. Uh, and this is a gamble. It's a roll of the dice. Uh, but Johnston knows that if this battle was his last chance, he is now entering the last chance of his last chance, if that makes sense. Um, so March 20th, uh, there's not going to be a whole lot going on aside from maneuvering. There is some heavy skirmishing. Um, the Confederates are going to be forced to stretch themselves pretty thin. They're going to turn to some of those cavalrymen. Uh, they're going to be fighting dismounted here to extend that um, left flank all the way to anchor it on the Mill, Mill Creek. Um, one of the problems with fighting cavalry dismounted is every, every fourth man has to hold the horses. Uh, so you're looking at 25% reduction in force right there. Um, we see down here Morgan's guys, they had been attacked from three sides. Now they are firmly in the middle of the Union line. They're going to meet up with troops under Hazen, uh, Major General William B. Hazen, right down here along the Goldsboro Road. Um, there is a brief action. Some of those guys from Morgan's division are going to pursue Hoke's division as they changed front, um, but really no result there, um, just, just a little bit of skirmishing. Uh, going on throughout the day. And you can now see the Confederates do have Sam Howell Branch in front of them. It is a good defensive position that they occupy, um, but the question is, is it going to do them any good? Is that attack going to come? Well, we go on to March 21st. Uh, Johnston is still on the field. Uh, the attack he's hoping for does not come, but Major General Joseph Mower is going to get permission to do a little reconnaissance by his Corps Commander, Frank Blair. Um, now, he's gonna move into position with his whole division and doing a little reconnaissance usually does not involve a whole division. Um, that's gonna be, Mower is gonna take that as a permission to just launch a full attack. So he's gonna attack that Confederate left that as we just discussed is held by only dismounted cavalry. Uh, and so it's going to be basically Johnston's cue to leave. Um, so as he attacks, now we can see we're up here on the Confederate left. The village is right in this area. And the only route of retreat for the Confederates at this point is this bridge over Mill Creek. So everything rides on holding that. Um, but Mower's attack is going to sweep right through Confederate headquarters. Johnston himself will have to flee on foot uh, to avoid capture. Uh, General Hardy is going to organize a very desperate counterattack uh, to try to stop Mower's men from being able to actually get in there and cut them off. Uh, but because Sherman did not order the assault, he's not going to reinforcement. He's not going to send reinforcements, so he doesn't support it and he will actually call Mower back. Uh, Mower's men were already in the process of being repulsed, uh, so they're gonna go ahead and withdraw. Uh, but it is at this point that Johnston sees it's time to go. Um, and so under the cover of darkness, the Confederates will leave the battlefield. Uh, cover of darkness, March 21st. There's some skirmishing that rolls into March 22nd, but for all intents and purposes, this is the end of the Battle of Bentonville. So the aftermath here, uh, there's 1,527 casualties on the Union side. Uh, they number 194 killed, uh, 1,112 wounded, and 221 missing. Um, after Bentonville, Sherman's going to go on to Goldsboro. Uh, he's going to rest his army group, meet up with Schofield, uh, and they're going to refit for a little while before pursuing uh, Johnston. Bentonville was a victory for the United States, but Sherman is keenly aware that he should have done more. Uh, he's talking about Mower's charge here. 
Uh, I think I made a mistake there and should have rapidly have followed Mower's lead with the whole of the right wing, which would have brought on a general battle and it could not have resulted other than successfully to us by reason of our vastly superior numbers. So Sherman's aware he probably could have ended everything right there had he supported Mower's attack. Well, for the Confederates, uh, 2,606 casualties, 239 killed, 1,694 wounded, and 673 missing. Um, and those are, of course, numbers that they can't replace at this point. Uh, and so after the battle, the Confederates are going to go right back up through Smithfield. Uh, they'll hold their final review near Selma. Um, of course, because they're unable to prevent Sherman from taking Goldsboro and linking with Schofield, um, Johnston is keenly aware that the end is near. And after Lee surrenders at Appomattox on April 9th, uh, that's going to be even more apparent. Uh, but the Army is going to continue uh, marching um, from Smithfield. They'll go through Raleigh and eventually end up in Greensboro before uh, surrendering their um, negotiations taking place there at Bennett Place. Um, so to wrap it up here, the Battle of Bentonville is the biggest and bloody, bloodiest battle ever fought in the state of North Carolina. Uh, here at Bentonville Battlefield State Historic Site, we tell the stories not only of the men who fought here, but also the civilian population. Uh, and so the ways to experience the battlefield here include a 10 mile driving tour. We've got almost five miles of walking trails. We do daily informative talks and demonstrations uh, tours of the battlefield, as well as the Harper House, which was a field hospital for that 14th Corps. Uh, and we do have special events throughout the year. Uh, so if you want to find out more about what's going on here, I definitely recommend you check out uh, on social media. We're at Bentonville SHS on all platforms. And if you have any questions um, about anything I've talked about today, please feel free to email me. My email is there, uh, chadwick.jeffords at ncdcr. Dot gov. Uh, but that about wraps it up. I appreciate your uh, appreciate your time.